heard about this today. Um, and some of the key findings of that tra traffic impact analysis is um, under existing conditions, if this was implemented today, and this is based on modeling, uh, modeling work, approximately 100 to 200 vehicles would be diverted uh, per hour, uh, per peak hour, from Shelburne Street. Um, this is, a, this is a, a little bit different than when previously, uh, there was a previous study done looking at um, a two-lane configuration on Shelburne Street, and the diversion from that was estimated to be in the range of three to 400 uh, vehicles per hour. So this is um, not quite as um, um, impactful as that. Um, one of the other things that the analysis looked at was what would be the diversion rate to parallel streets. So uh, Richmond, Cedar Hill, and Gordon Head would be the, the streets which would experience some level of traffic increase. Um, in, addition, in addition, one of the things they, they analyzed was what would be the travel time delays for uh, uh, both in the southbound and northbound directions in the peak periods. And for southbound AM, it would be approximately 78 seconds, and PM northbound would be 156 seconds. Um, and additionally, there was modeling conducted looking at um, conditions in 2038, so projecting forward and using some of the, um, the data in terms of uh, what they anticipated um, increase in traffic volumes is Emily, um, and they, there's also numbers provided there. The, the travel time delays are, are relatively similar, um, but there, there would be additional vehicles that were off of the Shelburne scenario. So in terms of looking at um, next steps and some of the, the process options for moving forward with this information, um, uh, there's four options that are identified in the report for Council. The first option is, is to seek uh, public feedback on the implementation options. Uh, I think it's, 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 it's fair to say that a lot of this information is, is, is fairly new information that wasn't, um, wasn't fully explored in, in, the, in the Shelburne Valley Action Plan process. So this would allow, um, option A would allow um, this option to be uh, fully explored in, in the public with key stakeholders and the general public to get a sense of um, uh, if there was any changes they'd like to see to any of the options or and if there was a preferred option that they would like to um, identify for council. Um, option B um, looks at separating the short-term mobility actions from the Shelburne Valley Action Plan itself. So in this scenario, uh, the, the broader 30-year directions of the plan, which is the majority of the plan, um, would, be would be separated from the, the short-term mobility actions. Um, the, the, the larger plan would proceed to, uh, to a public hearing while there would be a separate process around, um, around the short-term mobility actions. In terms of looking at the, uh, the pros and cons of this option, um, one thing that could create is confusion in the community around having a, a separate process for the plan and then the, the implementation items. Um, conversely, one of the benefits would be it would, it would provide uh, closure and clarity um, for, for developers and other, other, other folks in the community that have been involved in this process. Um, options C and D uh, center around council endorsing one of the mobility options in principle and either proceeding to the public hearing on that basis or focusing or directing staff to focus their the, the public engagement around that particular option. So um, presuming that, that uh, council, um, council recommends going back out to the public and, and exploring the options further under one of the, um, one of the process options, uh, the general process would be to um, engage in public consultation um, in, in November of this year. Um, and uh, report back to council um, in early early part of 2016 to seek direction on whether to whether to proceed to the public hearing and what amendments would be appropriate to the plan. So, in closing, the recommendation is that council receive the report for information and direct staff to seek public input on mobility implementation options. Thank you, Mr. Scott. I'd like to introduce you as the manager of community planning. So, for everybody in the audience to know that, and apologies. Um, I see hands among the council, but I think at the point, well, the mayor did make a comment before we invite the public or a question. Yes, thank you, Chair. Just a quick question. Has any of the material that we've seen today been uh, put before the working group that existed for several years? They were community based and uh, they helped develop the Selma Valley Action Plan. Uh, is, is the working group still around? Are they still being engaged? That's my question. So through, through the chair, um, yes, the working group is still engaged. Uh, we met um, uh, last week with them to uh, give them a preview of the report and, and answer questions. And the intention is um, that as we move forward, they're still uh, an integral part of um, 
uh, assisting staff in developing engagement techniques and providing feedback on the plan. Just a quick follow-up, how do they provide any feedback? Is it expected that they provide feedback directly to us, or do they provide it to you and then you report to us? Uh, through the chair, um, the, I think it happens through both channels. Um, many of the um, uh, state, stakeholder committee members uh, provide feedback as individuals, um, but there also is opportunities within um, the stakeholder meetings for them to provide input and feedback and, and help um, shape some of the some of the public engagement and, and provide feedback on the plan direction. So it would be both. Okay, so just to uh, answer my, uh, my final question, if I can, is um, given their experience and their long time with this project, have they provided an endorsement? Other than to just say to go out to the public and to share. Yeah, I think... Um, uh, I ask that because they're very, very vocal about road design and things like that. So I'm just curious how they've expressed themselves. Um, uh, through the chair, uh, I think when we had the meeting, uh, it's fair to say in terms of uh, the, the mobility improvement options and you know, option one, option two, there was really um, uh, a 50-50 split in the group in terms of which option was preferred um, and um, some acknowledgement that, that there, was, there would be a benefit to um, uh, exploring it further in the community and them having a chance to, to look at um, some of the design and provide feedback on, on some of the elements. But there wasn't um, a unanimous, uh, uh, this is the option we should go with 100%. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Welcome. Welcome. Good questions. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, I'm in a sample, uh, I, to be fair, we'll do another, do you both have questions? I'm just wondering, can, do we want them before we get to the public? And I did open the door, obviously, by allowing Mr. Mayor to do that. So, Councilor Wirtland, then Councilor Brown. Thank you very much, Chair. I think that's a question. Lansdowne and Richmond, I think we learned a bit of a lesson there as we experimented. And have we considered closing off one or two lanes on Shelburne before we move too far into this process? To see it from your act, in reality, it is a workable situation. And also, coming back to closing transit bus space, how does that impact? I believe there is an opportunity, and I don't think, you know, what do you think? How do you feel? Uh, through the chair, um, in terms of the uh, the, the piloting, I guess you could say, of, of, of lane closures, that's certainly um, something that, that could be considered um, under some of the options. Um, and we look for council direction in that regard, um, in terms of how, how we choose to implement it. Um, but it's something that certainly could be considered depending on the, the, level, of, um, the level of implementation that would be required. If it, if it means moving curbs and things like that, it's a little bit tougher to try all those things. Uh, but it's certainly something that be, could be considered as a part of the implementation. Um, and in terms of the second question around uh, uh, bus bays, the, um, the the idea with removing bus bays in uh, option one, in, in anyways, is is that it doesn't uh, it prevents the need for um, transit to pull in and out of traffic. In addition, it it, it really does create a, a significant amount more pedestrian space um, to really improve those those transit waiting areas and oftentimes provide separation from uh, uh, for for the sidewalks. Um, in an option two, uh, in, the, in the areas where it would be one travel in each direction, the bus space would be kind of a necessity uh, because the buses would need to, to pull off to um, provide, um, uh, to allow, to maintain traffic flow. Just one more question. The whole process we've gone through hasn't been setting as, shall we say, shining star. <laughs> and the question I'd like to ask, we have options one and two. What's option three? I see an option three. Do you see another option? Through the chair, certainly um, if there's an opportunity for to engage uh, in, in public feedback, um, there, there would be the potential for, um, for, for uh, refinements to, to either one of the options, which could potentially result in option three. I think um, it certainly would like to be open-minded to, to changes that, that are out there. And if there's a strong public support for uh, a particular option, that's a modification or variation of one of the two options, and that's certainly something that, that we could consider and bring back to council for consideration. And I'd just like to ask one more question. Would option three just be to go ahead with the draft plan over 30 years that we talked about through the whole process? 
Um, through the chair, I think um, one of the things that's laid out in the report is, is a number of alternative options. I didn't cover them off um, in, in my report in the in presentation in the interest of brevity, but um, there's a couple different options there in terms of um, implementing, you know, cycle track all the way along Shelburne Street, which would likely require um, fairly significant property acquisition, or um, a more of a status quo approach in terms of waiting for redevelopment to, um, for, for waiting for redevelopment to um, implement as this redevelopment occurs. So that uh, those were those are things that were explored at a conceptual level. Is that what you're uh, driving at? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what we went over the public with, I believe. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. My comment is actually uh, to the engineer. That's okay. Um, so in the scenarios, there is some um, comment around traffic, um, 100 to 200, flowing to Cedar Hill, Richmond, and Gordon Head. But I don't think I saw anywhere where there could have been some um, information about in the time frame is there any capital improvements to those three roads in your five-year catalyst? Uh, through the chair to Council Brown, in, in our five-year plan, we did talk about Cedar Hill and Richmond being part of that. Okay. Uh, but that, um, yeah, of course, when we're looking at the cost related to Shelburne Street, and uh, in terms of we're going ahead with one of those two options, we would have to reevaluate those five-year plans. And that may mean that um, some of those parallel streets wouldn't be set as a, as a higher priority uh, compared to other parts of the municipality that we would also want to focus on. And uh, with, both, with those streets, uh, are any of them on uh, your plan for safe routes to school or have the schools in those, on those roads who don't which one more than already been dealt with? I'm just trying to think of higher priority where you could. Yeah, through the chair of Council Brownoff again. Uh, I, I have to go look at specifically each one of those safer to school plans. I believe the one at Doncaster had some implementation already uh, implemented, uh, yeah. as you saw with a lot of the, this past year with the new sidewalks on Cedar Avenue um, and close to the school, and that was part of the safer to school plan. Uh, I would have to look at the other ones to see where we're at with those. Okay, thank you. Councillor Haynes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, amazing detail. Plan. Thank you very much for um, preparing this. Um, I have a couple of brief questions. When you talk about the diverted traffic, just so I understand these numbers correctly, on Table 5, there's 100 to 200 cars diverted from Shelburne Street, peak period. Then you look about, down below, you look at traffic increase on Cedar Hill, traffic increase on Richmond, traffic increase on Gordon Head, peak period. And it says, for example, percentage traffic increase on let's say um, Richmond, uh, Cedar Hill, 10 to 15 percent. Is that 10 to 15 percent of the base of the existing traffic on Cedar Hill, or 10 to 15 percent of that diverted traffic off of Shelburne? Because in which case it will be like uh, 30 cars. So I'll try and answer that question through the chair to uh, Councillor Haynes, but at some point uh, Urban Systems is here to help answer some of those detailed questions. But uh, essentially the 15, 8 to 15 percent is an increase to that road. So if it was Richmond of 8 to 8 percent, that's an 8 percent increase to the peak period on that road. Cedar Hill would be a 15 percent increase to that road. So not an overall 15 percent diversion from Shelburne uh, to those roads. It's, it's looking at the base of that road. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, a supplemental question, if I may, to engineering. Um, this morning, um, some of us met with the concrete industry, and some of the points they raised about the use of concrete in roads, etc., and their job is to sell concrete. But they raised a couple of interesting things where bus stops in Vancouver are converted to the use of concrete over asphalt because of the different performance of asphalt under the stress of start and stop of heavy vehicles. And that there was a cost saving, a significant cost saving, if that was done at bus stops and at intersections. Is this something that would be considered here, or is it going to stay asphalt? Why don't you just give us some thoughts on that? Yeah, through the chair, uh, uh, Councillor Haynes, certainly that would be a consideration for it. Um, the, the concrete uh, bus pads that you're describing uh, obviously do have a much longer lifespan. It prevents the shoving and heaving from 
heavy buses that when they come to a stop consistently are pushing our asphalt. Uh, and that's the reason for the implementation, specifically like on a B line for Broadway Street, for example. Uh, we would probably look at that as a, a part of the component uh, for Shelburne Street. We just haven't got to that detail in the design yet. Now, how about this? If I may include the chair, the intersection part. Because um, if we look long term on our road maintenance, would it make sense to do, go concrete on the intersections where, again, there's more shear of cars turning? Uh, that would probably be, um, sorry, through the chair of Councillor Haynes. We, that may, may not be as straightforward. Uh, our intersections have a lot of underground utilities um, and external utilities that are constantly cutting that road. Uh, as soon as you put concrete in, uh, it can be, there's some good pros and cons for it. Uh, great for highways where you're not necessarily having to lift up the road constantly and then breaking the integrity of the road. But where we have uh, intersections like that, uh, asphalt usually proves to be a better uh, pavement surface. Okay, thank you very much. That was very useful. Thank you, Council. At this point, we'd like to invite members of the public to provide input on the item. Again, if you don't mind introducing yourself and your address, please, for the record. If you are speaking on behalf of a community association that has done consultation within your community association, would you kindly let us know? We will therefore adjust the clock to 10 minutes, and we don't have that awkward moment of interrupting you to see if you have done that consultation. So, welcome. My name is... Daryl Wick, live at 1491 Edgemont Road. For me, the uh, potential cycling through the Shelburne Valley has been a roller coaster ride, oscillating between hope and frustration. I was part of the Bicycle Advisory Committee 25 years ago, identifying Shelburne as a vital link for cycling. And then Council wisely added that to the OCP as part of the official commuter network. But I have to say, it's been a disappointing 25 years since then. In fact, I think it would have been easier to put the bike lanes on back 25 years ago than now. <coughs> then I saw the Shelburne Valley Action Plan and I read one of the first pages. And just to read this short bit, for the Shelburne Valley, the most urgent needs are mobility network enhancements to better accommodate walking, cycling, and public transit. So I was quite encouraged. Then I read a little bit further and saw that, in fact, it was a 30-year vision implementation plan, and there was nothing in there to allow for cycling as an intermediate stage. So I think that would have been 55 years before I'd see cycling <laughs> on Shelburne. But then along came the supplemental report, and again, I've got hope, and i really like to congratulate the authors of that. It's thinking out of the box. And specifically, mobility option number two provides, is, provides the first transition from what we have on Shelburne now to the ultimate plan. And it, and it supports a phased path to this final ultimate road design. Based on that, I urge council to endorse mobility option number two for public engagement and this would provide a better focus for that public engagement. And I also support what is recommended as support process option B, where you separate the short-term mobility actions from the Shelburne Valley Action Plan and forward the remainder of the public hearing so that developers can start the process. But I think the important part really is to make sure that you endorse mobility option number two so we can actually see cycle lanes and start this transition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wick. Any further speakers? Welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. My name is Soren Henrich. I live in Victoria. I became involved in the Shelburne Valley Action Plan process as a stakeholder through the uh, Friends of Boker Creek. And your address, Mr. Soren? 1739 Haltane Street. Um, what um, the stakeholder experience was, um, I quickly had to set aside Boker Creek because three of the four years from 2009 to 2012 were spent on mobility uh, issues. And this is a case study in um, a stakeholder group that became very organic. Um, I heard tonight the number of uh, 55 people, which um, brings forth the image of herding cats, which is how it was described by Harold Stanley in the initial stages. Uh, so I don't know, I didn't actually see 55 people at any of the stakeholders' meetings, so that was probably a mailing list 
And so what happened was uh, perhaps a self-selection of about perhaps 16 on average at the peak time of participation at the stakeholders' meetings. So um, as a case in point for the, the governance um, issue, um, it was, there was nothing to guide us. Um, we all, I think, worked very well together. Um, at Sanish residence. I think I was the only one from Victoria um, that became very interested because I was wanted to see how things would play out for Boker Creek. Uh, so we're um, here. We are at uh, at this stage. I won't make any comments about what I think would be the preferred option, but uh, certainly what I hear is the the motion um, forward is for public engagement. So for um, for staff recommending that council approve public public input um, for the what I see are the two uh, recommended options that are presented by staff, and I would also like to just commend um, Sanich staff for bringing forth that second hybrid option. This was something that the stakeholders were um, struggling to see in the plan from the early days. So here we are after a. 18 month hiatus. Um, we had reconvened last week, and I think we're all um, I think we're all interested in, in looking more closely at the two options that are presented. Uh, certainly, we can't. Um, I don't know if we're going to have consensus on which one, because we are just a, a cross section of of people representing community groups in Saanich, and and me as a, a user of Shelburne Valley um, or the Shelburne Street as a cyclist as um, my, my children bus to Vic along Shelburne, um, so I, I use it in various ways. I walk, I explore um, the Creek Way, and so I, so I do have a regional interest um, in the use of the of the uh, the right of way and, and and how it affects. So certainly there will be more specific comments that will come from individuals on the stakeholders committee, and um, and we'll see how it plays out collectively. I would like to make a recommendation in. When we, if the council um, votes to approve advancing to, to public input, that um, of course the stakeholders, I heard from Cameron Scott that the stakeholders will still be part of that, um, that uh, input process. And when it advances, should it advance to open house, that the framing of any um, input or survey questions also be vetted in advance by the stakeholders committee because the form of those questions can. Uh, can in influence the outcome of uh, how the public support is read um, in, the, in the final um, final outcome. So, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Welcome our next speaker, please. Uh, my name is Martin Simmons, sixteen twenty Christmas Avenue. I would have loved to have been involved in the process of this, but. Uh, uh, of the plans available, uh, the first one, Plan A, uh, just with trees cut, I think is horrifying. Plan B is the better of the two, but I would like you to investigate the, the third option where you are actually creating parallel routes to Shelburne, because I, I object to Shelburne being called the most desirable route to walk or cycle. It is by design right now the, the route that is a necessity to take. I've walked from as far as Cabo Bay to Mayfair and Rock Bay and quad, uh, down to Jubilee, and I, I know the area extensively. And Shelburne is the most unpleasant place to walk. Okay? You don't go there unless you have to. I live near Shelburne and Cedar Cross. And if I wanted to go up to Tuscany, I have to go along Shelburne. There are no parallel routes in the side streets. So I would like you to investigate some way where you know, cyclists don't like going on Shelburne for fun. They do it because it's the only route through. And as a member of the Montgomery Community, Community Association, I would like the area to be considered not so much a route to somewhere else, but I think I want to build something that we can actually enjoy as pedestrians and members of the community. So a cycle route all the way up and down the Shelburne, that's fine. Trees, let's keep the trees, but I would preferably see routes parallel to Shelburne that you can actually walk cycle and not have to worry about a bus coming by. So I think there are more options that we should creatively be thinking about. And I please, please, more invest, more involvement of the community. So more parallel routes, 
It's not a fun street. It's not, it's not the desired path. It's the necessity path. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Welcome our next meeting. We seem to have a queue forming along the wall there. That's the way you wish to go ahead. Please feel free. Uh, good evening, Mayor and, and Councillors. Uh, my name is Lee Tyson. I live at 1515 Louise Place. I'd like to thank you and I'd like to thank the staff as well for uh, bringing forward the Supplemental Report to the Sheldon Valley Action Plan. I think it's a step in the right direction for Sheldon Valley residents and I think it's a step in the right direction as well for residents of Sandwich as a whole. But I think it still has some shortcomings, particularly in the evaluation of, uh, of the options. So one thing that we've really been informed when we've read the report, we noticed that there is a consultant's report that looks at traffic, the traffic impacts of the hybrid uh, option. Um, and that's, that's to the good. Obviously, we need that kind of information. It, it, it's very, very clear. But for heaven's sakes, where is the analysis and the data when it comes to the estimates of increased bike traffic on Shelburne? Where is the analysis when it comes to the quality of experience of the bike traffic, the, the level of service, if you will? Where is the data on um, safety for, for bicyclists, reduced probabilistically uh, fatalities and, and injuries to bicyclists? Secondly, where is the analysis uh, and, and the data when it comes to greenhouse gas impacts of the two options? They're simply not there. And then finally, as alluded by, by the last speaker as well, where is the analysis and the data when it comes to uh, how the two options play out in terms of the quality of life of residents of the Shelburne Valley, uh, their experience on the streets, and the impacts on local business as well uh, between the two options? These are all critical questions to my mind. And the information, the analysis hasn't been done, and the information isn't there. Turning very quickly then to the traffic impact analysis report itself, it still takes a very monolithic, linear look at traffic and traffic projections over time. And the concept of transportation demand management is conceptually applied in the report, and this has been consistent throughout the whole process, is applied to people who take buses, people who bike, and people who walk. But that same concept doesn't seem to apply to car drivers. And believe me, the hybrid option, in fact, is going to induce changes. It's going to induce reductions in choices to, to, to take vehicles. So a straight linear projection from historical trends simply is not an accurate, is not a good methodology for assessing these, uh, these options. Um, so I, just in conclusion, I think, I believe that um, the negative impacts of the hybrid uh, option have in fact been overestimated in the evaluation. I think that the interaction effects of reduced car lanes and increased bike lanes has been ignored. And I think overall some of the positive, many of the positive impacts um, of the hybrid option, option two, in fact have been underreported because they simply haven't been evaluated. So again, I still think it's a step forward, but I would, what I'd like to ask you to do, if this does go forward, if you recommend that this goes to public consultation, what I would ask is that more work, that you direct staff to do more work in filling in the information gaps that are currently in the plan, which I believe will bias decisions, they'll bias public input. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thiessen. Uh, I have noted your questions, and when we are completed with the public input, I will ask staff to come back and answer those questions as best we can at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Would our next speaker please come forward? Welcome. Hi. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council Members and staff, Senator staff. Um, my name is Cindy Marvin, and I'm here both as a resident of the Shelburne Valley. I live at 4245 Shepherd's Place. And also as a representative of Women's Everyday Bicycling Association, it's an association that is uh, intended to assist uh, women and families with riding for everyday reasons, so basically transportation riders. And I was really pleased to see this supplemental plan because as I think it was one of the first speakers mentioned, the timeline for me of you know, 30 years of the, of the vision of the, of the ultimate design concept is just far too long for us to wait for um, the ability to actually have a straight, direct, flat route 
um, between, say, where I live and where other people in the valley live, uh, downtown to where we work, and out the other direction as well. Um, in terms of the two options, I would endorse, I would strongly suggest you consider option two. I never thought I would uh, be endorsing against a cycle track because, as you may know, um, cycle tracks are actually the preferred cycling option, especially for women, uh, families, older people. And if we're really uh, concerned about getting more people on their bikes, for all the, the good reasons that there are, that's what we really ultimately have to work towards. So while I endorse option two, um, I would also say that with a caveat that we continue to work towards the ultimate build out of the, you know, the vision, although I realize the many constraints there are to doing so. The reason why I'm interested in the second option is, is the key fact that it is a continuous route. Um, if you do not have a continuous route, if your cyclists are, are going to be left in the same situation that they are in right now, which is winding back and forth off of Shelburne Street and trying to find that parallel route that does not exist really um, presently. And I both drive and ride my bike every day pretty much to work from where I live downtown, and I use Shelburne Street both as a driver and as a cyclist. And I would like to point out also that if you have a cycle a bike lane and you have a turn lane, already you may improve, you may actually improve the flow of traffic somewhat because you don't have drivers having to pull out into the other lane of traffic, slow down, going around cyclists, or trying to turn left when there's no left turn lane, blocking the lane of traffic that way. So I think I, I would also endorse the former uh, speaker's many comments that I, I totally agree with, that there's a lot of benefits to the hybrid option. Um, both for cyclists and motorists that may or may not actually have been addressed in the um, transportation analysis. And I'm sure that